Well, we have started actually from the very beginning with the question what law is. And we have said that law is there because without law, we're living on anarchy and our relations are not regulated at all. And if the re relations are not regulated any, this means someone who is more powerful than you can simply beat you and take whatever they want from you. With law, this is not the case. With law, we're all equals before law, before the state, and we're treated equally. And our relations are bound by standards. We have norms then. We know with whom you can marry, with whom you cannot. What happens to your property if you die? Uh, what if you have hairs? What if you don't? What if you make a car accident? What if someone dies or what if it's just a um, uh, small loss? All of them are regulated by the same law. Law is binding the members of one society. And law is bringing values and standards. So, perhaps you have already heard of this Latin saying, ubi societas uh, ibi jus. If there's society, then there is law. If there's society, then relations are structured. Law is, as discipline, studied under two branches, municipal law and international law. And we're quite familiar with municipal law. Those two branches have also two extra branches under them. They're known as public law and private law. Private law is, we have said that, uh, we have spoken about your property actually. What happens to your property when you decide to uh, sell it or when you rent it or what if uh, you die? So what happens is regulated by private law. Civil law, your marriage, your divorce, they're all regulated by private law. Public law is there, it's mainly under administrative law about taxes that the state cuts, or it is about, for instance, um, auditing the executive branch, for instance. And it is about criminal law and constitutional law. So the state itself, its relations with other institutions and so on, they're all regulated by the public law. Public and private distinction also applies for international law. In international law, this clause is solely about actually public law. But private law is also quite important, although we won't be studying this in this class. Uh, if you're a management student, you need to know about this. Imagine you're a Turkish citizen and you start a business somewhere in China and you decide to expand your business to Africa, then you start a branch in Egypt. Now, if things go wrong, is because you're a Turkish citizen, uh, is it Turkish laws that are going to regulate the problems? Is it Chinese laws, because that's where you have started the business? And what if things go wrong in Egypt then? Is it Egyptian laws, Chinese laws, Turkish laws? Which one to implement? Therefore, this kind of law is also known as conflict of laws or conflict of national laws. So which one to implement? Well, this is not impossible to regulate, of course. It can be regulated. In contracts, there are always clauses saying that if any dispute should arise, then um, X court in Turkey is going to be in charge of the disputes of uh, this contract or if it's too complicated, it's Turkey, it's China, it is um, Egypt, and let's imagine the most friendly law to regulate this kind of a business is, let's say, British law. So it can also be said that this business is subjected to uh, British law under that and those uh, articles. So private law is about private interactions, business interactions, international marriages, international companies. Today we need it actually a lot because we're living in that neoliberal system and the companies are always, they need to 
uh, be in touch with foreign states. They have branches in foreign states, and there are always disputes to be regulated. Therefore, that's what's necessary, but we won't study it any. International public law is about the relations in between states or intergovernmental organizations. What are intergovernmental organizations like? Like the UN, like NATO. So it governs the relations in between mainly states, also intergovernmental organizations. Why is that necessary to regulate the relations in between states? Well, for instance, when you're in Europe, it is possible for you to take a cruise over the river uh, Danube. And if you're sailing through Danube, then probably you're passing through numerous states, right? How about you do the same on Tigris, where you start from Turkey, then you sail through Syria, and then you go to Iraq, and you reach Gulf. Um, is it possible at the moment? Well, at least you can say that those things are regulated in between states. So that regulation belongs to the public law. When you buy a plane ticket from Istanbul, you start and you want to land in London. Well, from Istanbul, your plane starts, of course, and it flies over, starting from Bulgaria, <laughs> numerous states. Do you ask uh, the permission of those states? Personally, you don't do it. As long as you don't take your car, then you don't need to. But the plane has already asked for permission. Or what else? Um, diplomatic issues. That Kashukçu issue. There was a murder in Turkey. Was that in Turkey? Well, the city was Istanbul. But it was happening in a consulate of which state? Saudi Arabia, that was Saudi Arabian territory then, actually. Uh, because that was a murder, Turkish police wanted to investigate it. And then permissions were necessary, of course. Do you remember or do you know anything related to Tehran hostage case? That lasted so long, 444 days, and Americans were held host hostage by uh, Iranian students. Well, they have invaded then the embassy of a foreign country. And, yeah, question mark. Or recently, last year, a couple of years ago, Turkey had a problem in Netherlands. Turkish minister wanted to land in uh, Netherlands. Well, it was a little bit complicated. She landed in Germany and then she has taken the highway to uh, Netherlands and she wanted to enter to uh, Turkish consulate. And Dutch police, they have blocked the street. Well, Dutch police and Dutch street, they can block Turkish minister, Turkish council, she can enter. But still, that was a huge problem. If that was possible if the actions were right or wrong of both parties. What else? Who's the state is also a huge question. Well, at the moment, we have witnessed two referendums. We have seen the referendum of Catalonia, and we have seen the referendum of northern Iraq and Kurdistan. Both of them have held a referendum, and both of them claim to become a state. But international society did not recognize them as state, or just a small minority did that. So who can become a state? What if you buy a private island and you suddenly claim yourself being the king or queen of your island? Then did you become a state if you make your own flag and you print your own money? Is it how it works? And who is a state, really? At the moment, okay, we have witnessed just two cases recently, the Catalonian case and Kurdish case. But in former times, for instance, as I was a primary school kid, on the maps that we used to have in our classes, Turkey's neighbors, on that map, we used to see uh, USSR on one, one hand, the Soviet Russia, and in Balkans there was Yugoslavia. That's what I learned as geography, and suddenly, they collapsed, and new states have emerged. 
Kosovo, Bosnia, Serbia, Croatia, Macedonia, are they really states? Should Turkey recognize them as states or not? Georgia, and so on. I mean, who is a state, who is not? Who should you uh, accept as a state, recognize as a state, and start your diplomatic relations, and who you shouldn't? Or what's the uh, legal system saying about that? They are all problems related to international public law. At the moment, Silk Road Project, you have heard of it, and I encourage you visiting the website of that Silk Road Project. That's a huge project. Uh, there are for about 40,000 other projects running under it. It's all about railways and highways and harbors and so on to facilitate international trade. So it is interconnecting the states. Once you start building highways or railways, this means you're going through some borders to what extent and how and who is in charge and so on. There are many questions. What if a crime happens on that way? You know, many disputes may arise. Which goods can be traded on that way? Those questions can all be uh, perhaps not solved, but at least given meaning to the public international law. Public international law is right in the inter um, intersection points in between international relations and law disciplines. In municipal law, it's unthinkable that politics somehow influence law. It cannot happen. Politics obey law. Politics is a game that's played under law. However, here international politics influence law. International politics uh, make an impact on law. And international law is the one we're using at the moment. That's a new one because the system is new. The system is established by 1940s on. And since then, we're expanding the uh, legal infrastructure. It is expanding on both ways. By the way, do you understand what I mean when I say the current system? What if you come across with aliens and they ask you to take them to your leader? Who do you take the aliens and to Atalar? To um, I was about to say Melik Göktek to Mustafa Tuna, who? To Erdogan, to Trump. What do you tell the aliens? First of all, you have to tell about the system. How you explain the system to an alien is how you perceive your system, actually. That's why I asked the question. Um, you tell the alien that this globe, this world, is actually divided in between nation states. Each nation has its own government or leader. So who do you want to talk to? It's like that. Uh, at the moment, we have numerous nation states all around the world for 200. And um, they're interconnected. They're not protections. They're not isolationists. They're not closed down. They're open. They make trade with each other. They are tied to each other with actually multiple ties, with culture, with language, with religion, with trade, with sports events, you know, from Olympics to football events. Uh, they need to be in touch with each other. And it, this system is expanding. And with the technical, technological advancements, things are getting, or the globe is getting smaller. That relationship is getting more tight. And the law is established in order to govern those ties. Do you have questions until here? Are you doing fine? Do you want to discuss anything, bring up any questions? Or... So we have said that it is expanding in both ways, vertically and horizontally. Well, horizontally, it's expanding. For instance, at the moment, in this class, we won't be studying uh, laws on cyberspace, but we know that it is extremely necessary. We have seen how Russia has manipulated the elections in the United States. And how they have done it is through cyberspace. So that space has to be regulated by international law. At the moment, what we have is uh, 
we have low of outer space because we have satellites there and there can be issues related to national security of nation states. We have law of air because airplanes are passing through our air uh, spaces and they can also be spying and so on. Uh, we have law of seas, who can fish where? Uh, fishing is one thing, who can look for oil where? At the moment, there is an ongoing problem in Mediterranean, as you know, uh, who are they? Total, Exxon, coming together with Israel, uh, Cyprus, who else? Egypt, Italy, Greece. who? Greece. Greece. Uh, they're trying to extract oil, not, uh, sorry, gas, and they're trying to somehow transfer it to Europe. And which path should they pick? Well, that's all about them. Law of sea, first of all, who can search for oil or gas where, who can extract it, and where to put the pipelines, where is it legal, where is it not. Law can tell us. Therefore, we had to expand our law of sea understanding in time. So this is how it's expanding horizontally. Vertically, it's also expanding, just like human rights. That's also an integral part of international public law, of course. Uh, your right to live, that's constant, of course. And we used to have capital pun punishment as one of the punishments sanctioning in uh, domestic penalization in time, it was seen that actually judges are also human beings and when they do mistakes, their decision cannot be undone anymore. So right to live was, or life was limited by the capital punishment. After capital punishment was removed, that right has expanded vertically. And many other rights or laws are also expanding vertically in such a way. International law, international public law is quite different than municipal law. What does that mean? For instance, when you commit a crime, then you know that you're going to be sanctioned by the court. This means we have a third party settlement. The enforcement is a third party enforcement. You give harm to me, but I don't, uh, I don't sanction you. The um, <coughs> court is sanctioning you. So a third party is implementing the sanction. The third party has the enforcement force, power. This is not the case in international system. In international system, we don't have an authority. We don't have an international police, for instance, to say that uh, now this country is wrong, they have violated the um, laws and so on. We don't have such a force to say this. No international police. We don't have an international court to penalize uh, states. Therefore, third part settlements in, in the way that we understand through municipal uh, law does not exist in international system. The sources are completely different. We have spoken about that. We have said that in municipal system, how we make law is that we have a parliament, we have uh, representatives there, and the representatives, they make, they prepare proposals either in commissions or on their own, they submit it. And if that submission comes to the agenda, then it is discussed. As a result of the discussions, perhaps the text changes, and then it is voted in, well, at the moment I'm saying parliament, but by the constitutionally authorized body, it is voted. And as a result, if it is adopted, then it is sent to official gazette, and it has an enforcement date, and we have an executive branch that ensures the implementation of the law, and if things go wrong, then uh, the hurted sides can simply go to the courts. So this is how the system works. We don't have an international parliament. We don't have an international executive. We don't have an international judiciary. And this is how we make law in municipal system, in international system. If we don't have any of those institutions, how can we talk about international law? Does it really exist? 
some scholars discuss it like that. And I told you, it exists. <laughs> And uh, it is just like baking a cake. I told you there is a conventional way of baking a cake that you need uh, flour and eggs and sugar. But it's also possible to bake a cake that's gluten-free without using uh, those ingredients. And the result is still a cake. So this is what we're going to do in this class, all right? Uh, the sources, we have spoken about dispute settlement, lawmakers and subjects. Here, it's not you and me making the laws. It is the parliament making the laws. So we have representatives and our consent is indirectly asked for the laws, not directly one by one. We are the subjects of law. In international system, states make law, states obey law. So the lawmaker and the subject are two distinct elements in municipal law, but they are the same in international law. The sanctioning is a little bit problematic. We have said that, first of all, the third party settlement takes place. Secondly, some scholars are saying that there is no sanctioning in international system, and it is really limited. First of all, use of force is prohibited by international law. And there's only one international authorized body to implement use of force, which is? Security. The Security Council, United Nations Security Council. If they can unite, if none of those five vetoes the decision, then they can start a military action against a wrongdoing state. A recent example is? The Libya case, true. We can also talk about embargoes. Recently, we have seen United States implementing embargoes on uh, who? On Iran, for instance, we have seen that. The thing is that, well, on one hand, yes, there's sanctions, there are economic sanctions like embargoes, there are diplomatic sanctions like downgrading the relations. Turkey has done it several times by pulling their ambassadors from. We have seen it happening in Armenia, we have seen that happening in Egypt, Israel, and so on. So downgrading relations take also place. The thing is that here, implementing those embargoes and so on, legitimacy problem arises a lot in international law because there is no court. US decides on its own to implement an embargo on Iran or uh, diplomatic sanctions happen also in such a way. Do you remember the crisis in between United States and Turkey? There was a visa crisis. Do you remember how it was? The visa operations taking place in consulates, US consulates in Turkey, they have decided to slow down the process. So you were asking for a visa because you have a meeting in March, but your visa appointment was given for May. So even though you take the visa, that wouldn't mean a Well, uh, this is taken by the initiative of the United States. And because of the element of reciprocity, Turkey has decided to do the same to them as well. And if it is still legitimate, was questioned. So sanctioning, yes, it does take place. But if it is legitimate, well, that's a question mark. At least states are discussing. It is dis disputable. And role of politics. We are sad that Politics in municipal <laughs> systems cannot influence law. Politics is held only within the infrastructure or within legal infrastructure. Politics should obey the laws and politics should, uh, that game should be established under the system of legal system of that state. Here it's not the same. Here, the international politics directly influence international legal system. Because it's the states making law, they make the states according to their political uh, intentions or benefits, interests, and so on. Did you get the difference in between municipal system and... You have a question, yes please. Uh, 
It is not use of force then. Peacekeeping is not use of force. It is just peacekeeping. But it is not attacking, sanctioning. It is not for sanctioning. It's not penalization. It is just for consolidation of peace, consolidation of the system, consolidation of the good order. So there are two distinct things. We'll come to that actually. We'll study use of force, and under that title, we'll also mention peacekeeping operations, and then you'll see that they're uh, completely diverse things. I have seen some other hands here. Yeah, yes, was, yes. I was going to say about Article 51 subdivision. It's also okay. exceptionalized. So. Okay. Yeah, we'll come to that. Good point. Actually, it's quite a good point, and we'll speak about that then. Any other questions? Shall I proceed? Well, some important features of international law. First of all, consent is the key in international law. We have said that lawmakers and the subjects of the law are the same entities. They're the states. States make law, states obey law. And they make law, this means they make agreements, and they sign it if they agree with that, if they really want to be bound by those treaties. And simply, they avoid signing such treaties when they think that uh, it is not for their best benefits. That's not uh, okay for their national interests. It has, of course, advantages and disadvantages. I'll come to that, but here consent is the key. And the source of the consent is sovereignty. That consent can only be used by the sovereign states. What does that mean then, being sovereign? Okay. I need no higher authority that uh, controls the decision of a sovereign state. Make True. They make their own decisions. What else? First of all, in their internal affairs, they're totally independent. And in their external decisions, they make, they decide with whom to have diplomatic relations, with whom not to, and what kind of relations do they want to have. They're all decided by the sovereigns. Reciprocity, which is also known as, do you know the other word for reciprocity? Do you remember? Mutuality is an important element of international law. We have recently given the example of visa operations of the United States and Turkey. And we have said that the United States have slowed down their visa operations in Turkey. And as a result, Turkey has done the same in the United States in Turkish consulates. So this is reciprocity. Mutuality teaches us one thing. I'll behave you in a way you behave me is mutuality. And because states are responsible to protect their citizens and their rights, they want to have good relations with other states so that they ensure that no one will be hurt. They won't hurt anyone. So as a result, their citizens won't be hurt. This reciprocity is actually a very broad term. And if I should give you a very simple example, it's like that. Diplomatic delegations come and go. They visit each other. When a delegation from United States comes to Turkey, we serve them at dinner. On the dinner table, there are also wine. And they toss uh, in the evening. And when Turkish delegation is in the United States, then Turkish delegation is served wine. As for Iran, when Iranian diplomats are in Turkey, on that table, no wine is served because we respect Iranian uh, norms, values, and vice versa. When Turkish delegation goes to Tehran, there is no wine on the table as well. So once we respect them, then they respect us back again in other implementations. This is how it goes. We know the norms of the state, and we behave according to, for US, we're open for wine, and for Iran, we're closed for wine. We don't push them to follow our ways. And then, when we have other expectations, we then know that, yes, they're going to respect, because we have respected them. 
So this is a very simple example, of course, about drinking issues and so on. Uh, however, this also implements to other things like the visa issue. Pacta sunt servanda is a really important principle in international law. That's a Latin phrase. And it means what? Yes? Promises must be kept. Promises must be kept. By this principle, we know that when a state signs the treaty, they're going to observe it. They're going to respect it. They're going to comply with them. States do not sign and non-comply. States either don't sign it, or once they start to violate it, then they say that I won't be able to keep it up. I better retreat, I better withdraw from this treaty. So by Pacta Sunt Servanda, we are not suspicious about our counterparts anymore. Once we conclude treaties, we trust them. All right? This part is important. International law in international relations. Actually, international relations theories are incredibly diverse. I've just involved a couple of titles here in the most general sense, but you already know that realism, we can also talk about neorealism, neoclassical realism liberals, neoliberals, uh, liberal institutionalists, constructivists, Marxist critical theory can be added. Well, there are diverse theories on international relations and it's so important for you to be able to associate your international relations knowledge with your legal knowledge. The thing is that how to. International law is giving us just the legal infrastructure. How can we use it in our international relations analysis? Is a question mark. Well, they have as they're diverse, their approaches towards international law is also diverse. They disagree with each other related to international law. Let's start with realists. When we mention realism, you think about anarchy. The entire international system is based on anarchy. And power matters. Power is what drives everything. Everything has to be practical, according to realists. For realists, they're not concerned about what is right and what is wrong. Realists are concerned about what is. Well, power matters. Who is more powerful? Then they govern the game. That's how it happens. There's a famous saying for realists. Strong do as they will, and weak suffer as they must. So, according to realists, there is no right and wrong. This means they are not concerned about international law. Well, for liberals, it is not the case. Or you can also say that for realists, international law, okay, if it matters, then it is made by the powerful ones for the benefit of, for the favor of the powerful ones. They make law and they govern the rest, the weaker states, with the laws that they make. That can also be discussed. At that point, then we can say that the hegemons are the makers of international law and the rest has to follow it. Um, for the liberals, well, they also agree with the realists, actually, that the international system is based upon anarchy. That's true. And they also believe that, yes, conflicts will also happen. For realists, conflicts are, well, they don't solve it, or when they solve it, they solve it through their strength, power, military muscles. 
For liberals, they believe that, okay, we're rational entities, states are rational entities, and the conflict can be managed. That's the difference in between. We can find common denominators with other states, and instead of damaging each other, we can work all together, we can cooperate, collaborate. We can build institutions for our, uh, for our cooperation. Um, they try to increase the mutual interdependence. They believe that the mutual interdependence, they believe that peace can be sustained by the hand of mutual interdependence. The more bonds are built in between states, the more peace can be maintained. So for them, international law is there in order to facilitate the cooperation in between, to facilitate the interconnectedness, to facilitate founding institutions. Questions until here? Could you follow everything? You were already knowledgeable about theories. I know what I'm trying to bring up here is the how to integrate law into them. As for the constructivists, they believe that our identities matter. The language that we use matters. Our rhetoric, our definitions, how we define certain concepts matters. The uh, norms and values are reflected by international law. The way, because law is quite related to formulation or codification, how you make the sentences. And those sentences reflect the general uh, tendency, the general perspective of international politics. How we perceive international politics is expressed through our identity, through our definitions, and we put them into international law. So, norm diffusion, difference or changes in our perceptions will be reflected in international <coughs> law as well. Law, international law, is a reflection of international perceptions. And Marxists. Each time, I start talking about Marxism in my class, there are always some students raising their hands, saying, but, and they start discussing with me about Soviet Russia. <laughs> my dears, this is an intellectual school here, okay? That Marxism. Soviet Russia is something else, and it is not a perfect representation of Marxism and so on. So please stop giving me such examples. And Marxism, while it's an intellectual tradition, it is not USSR, it is not Soviet Russia, and it's a legitimate school of international relations. It's not the representation of the left, you know, just drop those uh, visions. Well, it has made very powerful contributions to international relations school. Their approach is more economics oriented. According to Marxist school, there are certain states that we call them core states, majorly. They hold the economic benefits, and there are classes, there are stratas in international society. Higher stratas are exploiting the lower stratas. International law is a tool that strong states, powerful states, are using against weaker states. This is international law is a tool of uh, core states to exploit periphery states. At that point, you can discuss that realism and Marxism quite similar, actually. For realists, military power matters, and they don't talk about exploitation. But Marxists talk about economic power, economic strength, and they also discuss about exploitation. So, there are 
sites that are economically more advantageous and there are weaker sites, they're exploited. And law is the tool of core sites. All right? Actually, we can have the list longer, but it's better. I mean, if we leave it here for a while and then you start developing your international law knowledge and perhaps at the end of the semester, we can turn to them once again in order to see how you can integrate your developed international law knowledge with international relations. Uh, but still, we can from time to time just uh, make experimentations about developing hypotheses or asking research questions that intersects international relations and international law.